Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. I've got to get this video recorded fast because there is a thunderstorm on its way. So the tension is ramping up. It's the first video of 2024 if you don't count the live stream. Thought I'd do a video about all of the movies that I kind of want to see in 2024. I realise that nostalgia is a big thing for a lot of people. For me and for the way I am as a movie buff, I want to keep looking forward to new things as much as looking back. And because January is the month where I'm only watching movies I haven't seen before, I thought I'd dive in and just take a look at what's on offering this year and some of the stuff that I probably can recommend to you or at least recommend that you check out if you're so inclined. I've got 20 of them. I can't guarantee all of them are going to be released this year, but I believe they are. So I'm going with my best guess for right now. Everyone, need your attention please. I'm going to burn this place to the ground. Number one, a bit of Jason Statham action. There's a movie called The Beekeeper, where Jason Statham plays an assassin for a very secretive organization called The Beekeepers. And when one of his neighbors is ripped off by an online scam and she commits suicide, he decides he's going to take down the people responsible all the way to the top. Not just your frontline people, but all of the very rich men who benefit from, from these kind of online phishing scams. I kind of like this one because A, it's Jason Statham kicking ass and blowing things up. And two, the enemy is basically an enemy that we all hate. We hate getting those calls on our mobiles with people pretending to be something they're not. And the idea of Jason Statham blowing the shit out of the people responsible for that is something that I can get on board with. I don't know whether it's going to be on streaming here or whether it's going to get a theatrical release, but either way. I'm going to watch it just for the fun of Statham kicking ass. So that's the first one I've got for you. The Beekeeper, my kind of jam when I'm in the mood for something that's not too mentally taxing, but has lots of splody bits. Whoa, hey, there's a cat in there. Second one, which is coming out in February, is a little bit of a hark back to 1980s action cinema. The plot's very reminiscent of a Romancing the Stone and Jewel of the Nile with Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner back in the 80s. Very big. And it's a movie called Argyle, which is directed by Matthew Vaughan, who has done some very kick-ass movies in the past and knows his way around doing action like a few other people. He did the Kingsman movies, for instance. And this is him possibly starting a new franchise. You've got Bryce Dallas Howard starring as Ellie Conway, a writer who is prophetic about real life things going on. And she doesn't live at home very much. She talks to her mother, played by Catherine O'Hara a lot. And she ends up being caught up in a spy thing with Sam Rockwell playing uh, the, a very undercover and very charming spy. She's got one of those really ugly inbred cats, which you see in the trailer. Can't stand those cats. I, I like my moggies to have a little bit of genetic diversity to them, and inbred cats don't do it for me. But it looks like it's fun. It's not to be taken seriously at all. And I can kind of get on board with that. I think I'd watch it on streaming rather than go into a hard top cinema to see it. The other people in the cast are pretty good. It's got Brian Cranston, Dua Leapers in there, John Cena. Samuel L. Jackson, who's in every spy movie by law. Um, Henry Cavill's in there as well. I'm fine with that. Any kind of tongue-in-cheek spy movie takes me back to the Flint movies and the Matt Helm movies of the 1960s with, um, in reverse order, Dean Martin and James Coburn. And that kind of cool 1960s spy vibe is very much apparent in the trailer for this one. And that kind of cool 1960s spy vibe is very apparent in the trailer and still having that 1980s jewel of the Nile. So I'm on board with that. Again, light stuff, but I'm cool with that. Third one, we've got Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part 2, with Timothy Chalamet again playing Paul and White de Betrades. It looks fantastic. The trailer looks fantastic. If there was a director who I would want to do a Dune movie series it's definitely Denis Villeneuve he's got a unique vision he knows what he's doing he's very very familiar with the genre and based on Dune part one which I liked he's incredibly respectful of the original intellectual property so that one I'm definitely going to see in a big cinema I may even try to go with the Titan Lux so I get the Dolby Atmos sound in the cinema looking forward to that a lot and I'll be there as soon after it's released as possible. When 
and I heard that Bong Joon-ho, the director of Parasite, is doing an American science fiction movie, which has, as many American science fiction movies do, an English an English leading actor. I'm there. Bong Joon-ho, I like. I've liked him as far back as the host, and I like what he says and the complexity he says it with. And this one is a science fiction movie that stars Robert Pattinson, Stephen Yeun, and Mark Ruffalo. It's an adaptation of a science fiction novel by Edward Ashton, which I'm not familiar with. And it follows the story of Mickey 17, an expendable who is a disposable employee on a human expedition sent to colonize the ice world Niflheim. When one iteration dies, a new body is generated with most of the memories intact. So it's a little bit like Moon. Bong Joon-ho is going to make it an entertaining film. There's no way he isn't. Pattinson and Tony Collette's in there as well. Mark Ruffalo, Stephen Yeun, Naomi Aki. Um, good cast. Uh, I want to see this one. I know very little about it apart from that praise I just gave you. But if you've seen Parasite and you've seen The Host, you're going to want to get on board with this one. Next up, we've got a follow-up to David Leach's last movie, Bullet Train, and it's The Four Guy, which has Baby Goose, Ryan Gosling, playing Colt Seavers, but it's based on the television series from the 1980s, with Lee Majors in it. Tons and tons of stunt action, and it's just going to be a lot of fun. I know a lot of the filming was done in Sydney. They closed down the Sydney Harbour Bridge to film some stunts on it one Sunday afternoon a while back. And when Hollywood wants to do something, the New South Wales government always says, are you going to use lube? Because they will do anything for a Hollywood production. And they've done it in this case. Uh, kind of looking forward to it. Who else is in it? Emily Blunt's in it. Winston Duke. Aaron Taylor Johnson's in there as well. Hannah Waddingham. No Australians come to think of it, which is a, a bit of a shame, but it's an American production. What can you do? kind of looking forward to it it might be a bit of fun i think i might wait for streaming or a physical copy of this i just don't know but i don't think it's seen in the cinema for me they rule the desert this one is an extension of the mad max universe furiosa mad max saga which is a prequel to mad max fury road uh, Anya Taylor-Joy is playing Furiosa, taking over from Shelley Theron, who played the older version of the character. We've got Chris Hemsworth in an Australian movie for a change. Who else have we got in there? Angus Sampson turns up, another Australian actor. Lockie Hume. So we do have a, a bunch of Australian actors, and I believe a lot of it was filmed here in Australia. Uh, it was filmed in Hay and Silverton. Silverton's where the second Mad Max movie was filmed, and the third, come to think of it. A town out near Broken Hill, beautiful town perfect for a Mad Max type movie so I'm looking forward to that of course it's George Miller directing and George Miller co-wrote it so I'm really cool with that be interesting to see how it plays out uh, I'm going to kind of ignore a lot of the PR hype with this one and maybe just watch the trailers and go in cold apart from that once they've ditched the toxic and not particularly great Mel Gibson from the franchise I think that uh, the Mad Max saga improved even though Tom Hardy was kind of mid as Max himself I think the universe and the intellectual property have legs and we should be able to get a decent film out of that to understand the dance you must first know the dancer both angel and demon next up there's a John Wick kind of same universe movie called Ballerina with Anna de Armas in it playing an assassin. I'm going to watch it just because it's a John Wick adjacent movie. You're going to see fantastic stunt work. You're going to see terrific camera work, beautiful cinematography, lots of kills, lots of fun stuff. And Anna de Armas has really delivered in the action roles she's had in the past. So I'm good with that. I want to see where that goes. I don't expect it to do the money that John Wick movies do. But I'm kind of cool with just enjoying the roller coaster ride of a pew pew stunt heavy movie with lots of kills and Anna de Armas in it. Hi. Hi. Deadpool 3 is coming out and it's got Hugh Jackman playing Wolverine again. And of course, it's got um, Ryan Reynolds playing the titular character. I'm not that fond of Hugh Jackman, to be honest. He's turned out to be a bit of an asshole in various ways. He was buddying up to the Trump kids during Trump's regime, which is never going to endear him with anybody. 
and he doesn't seem to be the kind of person his image projects him to be but having said that it's going to take the piss out of a lot of superhero franchises and a lot of tropes of superhero movies ryan reynolds knows what he's doing with this kind of stuff and so deadpool 3 which hasn't quite got a title yet is something that i want to see and enjoy and just have a chuckle with There's a lot of tailors in this list. Aaron Taylor Johnson in Craven the Hunter. It's a Spider-Man adjacent movie that Sony's doing because they've got the rights to many Spider-Man villains. He's playing Craven the Hunter, one of the great Spider-Man villains. Whether it's going to land well as a Spider-Man-ish movie, I don't know, but I'm going to go and see it. I may well wait for streaming, but I might see it in the cinema if it's a slow week. I'm kind of cool with this kind of movie. And even though Sony's Spider-Man villain movies took a big dip with Morbius. I'll give this one a go. The trailer looks okay. It's got the usual origin story in there, which may drag things down a bit, but I'll give it a go and see. There's also Madam Web with Dakota Johnson in it. Another Nepo baby in this list. That one I'm less in love with, but I think it's going to go directly to streaming here in Australia, probably. And so I'll give that one a go as well. I'm locked into watching superhero movies. I'm unashamed in that. I watch a lot of other kinds of films as well, but one of my comfort movie genres is superhero movies. So I'm going to go and just check that one out. And I'll probably let people know on the channel what I think of it. Beetlejuice 2, Electric Boogaloo. But it does have Winona Ryder playing the same character she played in the original. Uh, I don't know very much about this yet, but we'll see how we go. But it may just be a cash cow on the intellectual property. But in case it's not, I'm going to give it a go. And I know that middle-aged geek girls are a big fan of Beetlejuice. So we'll probably see it and with a bit of luck we'll enjoy it. Next up is a sequel to a movie that a lot of people hated. I didn't mind it. I thought it was a derivative of a whole bunch of other better films, but I don't think it was a bad film necessarily. And it's Joker Folie Adieu, which is the sequel to the Joaquin Phoenix Joker, which is still a step up from the Jared Leto Joker. And in this one, you've got Lady Gaga playing Harley Quinn. And we'll see how that plays. It's going to play totally differently, for, of course, from the other version of Harley Quinn we've got on the big screen with Margot Robbie. But we'll just see where it goes. Uh, I don't have any expectations one way or the other with this one. It's going to be worth at least checking out. And it's going to be controversial. And there are going to be a lot of fanboys of comic books screaming about it. So there's going to be entertainment for everybody in one way or another, whether it's in the movie itself or on social media. Jordan Peele's doing another movie this year as well. Nobody knows anything about it, which is good, because going cold into Nope really worked well for me. And I'm looking forward to anything Jordan Peele wants to throw out there. He's about due for a flop, but I'm hoping he doesn't get it, because I know he works really hard at these things. And he has a creative imagination that is really paralleled in american cinema and so i'm going to see what i can find about this one and go in and see it i think it'll be worthwhile doing that and i hope it's entertaining and groundbreaking the way that nope was there's a remake of nosferatu which is definitely a nepo baby fest because it's got bill skarsgård and lily rose depp skarsgård's playing nosferatu and lily rose depp is playing the object of his desire uh, I think it can work. I think that the best Nosferatu movie, apart from Nosferatu, is still Shadow of a Vampire with Willem Dafoe. But we'll see where they go with this one. It kind of parallels Voyage of the Demeter, which came out last year. But we'll, we'll check it out. And it's a vampire movie, so I'll probably go to see it anyway. At this stage, I have no expectations at all. But I want to see what Robert Eggers does with it. He did a great job with The Lighthouse, so we'll see how we go. 19 states have seceded. The United States Army ramps up activity. The White House issued warnings to the Western forces as well as the Florida Alliance. A24 is putting out Civil War, which is about a near future civil war in America along party lines and the MAGA people versus the same people in America. And I know that's going to get some comments, but I don't care because it's engagement. It looks good. It doesn't look like it's got an enormous budget, but I think it punches well into the current fears and concerns of a lot of people around the world 
and I think that its box office and word of mouth are going to only be helped by all of the people who are going to crack the shits and complain about it on social media. That one I'm looking forward to because a lot of the best films of any era are based on the fears and concerns of contemporary times. This one definitely hits that and having A24, a smaller studio, do it rather than the big guys who are so concerned with their corporate image and bottom line not touching it I think it, it could work and I think it can steal the play lunch of a lot of other movies that come out around the same time I hear that there's a Knives Out 3 coming out a new Benoit Blanc movie whether it's going to be on Netflix or whether it's going to get a physical release I don't know but I want to see more of Benoit Blanc I think that Ryan Johnson's a very clever filmmaker I think that Daniel Craig has found his second wind with Benoit Blanc and I'm cool with that I want to see who they get as the ensemble in this one. I want to see what the mystery is. And I want to see where Benoit Blanc goes in the future. So that one I'll be looking forward to. It's one of my most looked forward to movies. If it does get a release this year. And at this stage, it's still up in the air. But I wouldn't mind checking it out. Alice? Alice? Thank God, can you hear me? Yeah. Are you okay? Daniel knows. And he now, this movie got delayed by the actor's strike in America because the star wanted the movie to get the best possible audience, so he delayed the movie with the cooperation of the filmmakers so that he could promote the film. And it's The Dry 2 with Eric Banner playing Aaron Falk. It's an Australian said detective thing again. And if you haven't seen The Dry, you should check that movie out. Fantastic film. Eric Banner has really found his iconic role. And Aaron Falker, a federal police detective, uh, investigating mysteries in the Australian bush, which is a very variable thing. It's not just deserts. In this case, it's in a um, temperate rainforest area of Victoria. And I like the first one so much, I am there to see this one in a cinema. At least as an Australian uh, film buff, I need to encourage good Australian cinema. I'm looking forward to seeing it in the cinema and just going along for the mystery. And from what I see, the supporting cast is very good as well. The next one's Maxine with three X's. The sequel to Pearl and X, the two Thai West movies starring Mia Goth. And this is a sequel to Pearl and X. Um, Pearl was set in the 1920s. X was set in the 1970s. This one set in the 1980s as Maxine, the surviving character from X, starts her career as an actress. Looking forward to that. Mia Goth is starring in it. I want to see where it goes because the first two were so messed up and entertaining. I'm looking forward to seeing this trilogy capped off. Mia Goth is on such a roll in the last couple of years that she's going to become a much bigger star, whether that's in a kind of cult exploitation movie genre or in wider cinema. I hear she's very good in Infinity Pool, which I haven't checked out yet. Maybe I should do that for January. I'm looking forward to Maxine and just seeing where Ty West takes this saga next. Next up, we've got a new Guy Ritchie film coming out, The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, which is a spy thriller set in World War II, based on the special operations executive of World War II, which Ian Fleming was involved with. And it's basically black ops against the Nazis. And I'm always fond of movies that kill Nazis, basically. We've got Henry Cavill in there, Isaac Gonzalez, Alan Richardson from Reacher, Henry Golding, Alex Pettifer, uh, Kerry Elwes is in there as well, Fisher Stevens. Yeah, I think that'll be a lot of fun. And Guy Ritchie getting his mojo back and giving us a World War II drama, which is somewhat adjacent to Inglorious Bastards, but more grounded in historical reality. Will be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm on for that one. I really want to see it. Apparently one of the producers is Jerry Bruckheimer making a comeback, which is kind of wild. That one is definitely, it says, got a release in 2024. It's from Lionsgate, kind of in the mood for another movie that has the same vibe as one of my favourite movies of 2023, Sisu. So we'll see how that goes. Second last one, Godzilla x Kong, The New Empire. Godzilla minus one stole the play lunch of the Godzilla MonsterVerse, MonarchVerse franchise. They're very different films using the same kaiju, though they don't call them kaiju in the MonarchVerse franchise, they call them titans, which makes them sound like a condom. I think that Godzilla minus one was lightning in a bottle, 
and the MonsterVerse ones are, are good movies in a totally shallower and flashier kind of kaiju movie realm. But the trailer looks really weird because Godzilla, when he gets angry, has pink glowing spines on his back, which may be a way for this franchise to cash in on the Barbie phenomenon. Phenomenon. But we'll see how we go with that. I'm there for the kaiju action. The Monarch Verse has also has Monarch Legacy of Monsters, a streaming series on Apple at the moment, which I'm enjoying because it's got Kurt Russell in it. We'll see where this franchise goes as far as cinema is concerned. I'm not sure whether the series links into this movie at all, but I'm enjoying the series at the moment, and we'll just see where this movie goes. Uh, Godzilla might as well may have elevated the expectations of an audience when it comes to kaiju movies. So we'll see whether it makes any bucks. Next one I've got for you is, and the last one, is Damien Leone is doing Terrifier 3, which is actually the fourth movie for Count All Hallows Eve, which also had Art the Clown in it. I saw the Terrifier movies in 2023 when Umbrella sent me the box set of them, and Art the Clown is... Uh, transgressive as hell. This is not a movie series for the faint-hearted. It's bloody, it's gory, it's horrifying, it's realistically horrifying, but it doesn't have the flashy sadism of, say, a Saw franchise. And they're doing Terrifier 3. I want to see it, I want to see where it goes, and I want to just see w whether they expand the universe and the mythology of Art the Clown any more than they did in the second one. Didn't think I'd enjoy this kind of film, but I do. And maybe that's what cinema's about. Expanding your horizons and liking films that you didn't really expect to like in genres you really aren't entirely comfortable with. So there's my 20 movies I'm looking forward to this year. There are others, and I may do an update on this at some stage in the future. Let me know whether you want me to do that, and let me know what your anticipated movies are for 2024. We're getting back to the cinemas somewhat. The strikes are over and there's going to be a flood of new material coming out, hopefully, and not just people cashing in on existing intellectual properties. Next time, I'm doing Science Fiction Saturday again. I'm going to try to find two science fiction movies I haven't seen before. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment. You can donate um, by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash movies or by becoming a YouTube member. The 2024 is bright and wonderful, and I think we're going to see some really interesting cinema. Nostalgia isn't the only thing in cinema. Seeing new stuff keeps us fresh and reminds us why, when we were young, we became mad cinema buffs. So, so until Saturday or Friday, if you're in the slow part of the planet, watch some old movies, watch some new movies, and I'll catch you next time.